The Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, has said it is reviewing its level of preparedness ahead of the forthcoming elections. As preparations for the 2023 general elections picks up pace, Chairman of the Independent National Electoral Commission, Professor Mahmoud Yakubu, is not mincing words as regards the Commission's uh, commitment to raising the bar of the standards set in previous elections. The unique thing about the next month's general election is that it would revolve around the Electoral Act of 2022, which paves way for technology to be deployed in the course of the exercise. For instance, it empowers the INEC to transit election results um, electronically from the polling units to a central portal in the Commission's headquarters. But there are uncertainties that still loom as INEC has warned that next month's general election faces serious uncertainties. While well, joining me to discuss INEC's preparedness ahead of the polls is Dr. Ndubisi Wokolo. He is the Chief Executive of Next Year. It's so good to have you join us, Dr. Good evening. Hi, thank you. Hi, Miriam. Good to see you. Great. Um, for someone who's interested in the civic space and the engagements that happen, and of course, every Nigerian is, you know, has their eyes fixed on 2023 polls and most people want to participate, how well do you think that we have, um, you know, raised the bar in terms of preparedness, whether it be on INEX part or on the electorate part? Do you see a change or a departure from what it was in 2019? Yes, I think so. I think, um, just like you said in your opening speech, the 2022 Electoral Act is the game changer. Technology is coming in and is going to drive the election. So this is uh, all like 2019 when even with the use of technology, um, those issues were contested in the court of law and because it was not part of um, our act. So it did it didn't mean anything, but now it meant so much, especially with Biva as coming in. Like you said, there will be electronic uh, transmission of the result. But more importantly is that it has given confidence to a lot of voters, especially the young people who understand technology. So to most Nigerians, they believe that their vote will count. And for me, I think I next doing everything humanly possible to make the vote of Nigerians to count. So, from the electoral art to its preparedness, other pre other preparedness in terms of logistics, in terms of security, they're doing all they all they can to make sure they dot their eyes and cross their teeth. But I have to equally warn that um, election is not just a standalone thing. You know, it revolves around a lot of things, especially our own infrastructure, which I cannot uh, do more than what they should do like internet penetration like electricity like roads and all that but most importantly that nigerians we're going to give it our shot we're going to give it our best and i believe that our best is going to be enough good enough for nigerians to elect whoever they want to elect whoever is going to be their leader or whoever they're going to elect into the various positions that will be contested I'm sure that you probably must have been eavesdropping on the first segment of this conversation. We're talking about an unknown aircraft that, you know, appeared from nowhere and killed many people and not just anyone, people who were protecting their community, vigilantes. Uh, the same thing happened also in Nasarawa State where, according to security agencies, it was a bomb that was dropped by a drone. And you and I know that drones cannot be flown anywhere just like that in this country i mean even if it's your personal drone you have to there has to be some limits to it but that drone was able to get as far as nasara to kill 27 people and i'm wondering these just like you say um the election is not a standalone thing so we have to take into consideration all of these things that are happening within our domain and how this might play out on election day don't forget on the other hand INEC facilities have also been attacked day by day mostly in the southeast um this can also be a plug and a spanner, you know, in the wheel of things, wouldn't it? Sure, sure. If you, um, for most Nigerians who are following publications by our organization next year, you could see that the last um, two to three months, we've taken our time to look at um, all the security implications, you know, that could affect the 2023 election. We did it uh, geopolitical zones, and we've been beginning to deepen it more. Um, like I said, or like all most people know, especially people who understand security, it's going 
going to be play an important role in this election. How we handle it, how the state security agencies act, act how the non-state security agencies will act. So for me, I think that will, there need to be a kind of collaboration even within the state and non-security state actors who who are providing security to be make sure that people are giving co that confidence to come out. However, people you know that if we start having a situation where you over securitize an environment, it might chase the people away. They wouldn't want to come out. But however, it is really important that the way you provide the security assure people come out and vote. They will surely come out. So, for instance, let, let's let's try taking examples now. In the southeast, where we have um, is, um, organizations like IPOB and ESN asking people not to come out to vote, how will the state security services like the police, the the uh, the defense corps, uh, um, and other 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 security agencies, what will they be doing to make sure that a lot of people will come out to vote? It's equally important that the way you try to securitize the place, deploy army and, 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 and the rest of them, you chase the people away. So you need, to, you need to make sure that there's a lot of messaging. There's a lot of strategic messaging that will show the people that we are not here to hurt you. We are not here to prevent you from voting. We are here to only provide that security. Even around the pulling boots, how will the police act, how will the other security agents act, so that the people will not think you're there to either favor one political party or the other. So that's around the southeast. Now let's look at the north central, northwest, where you have the boundary trees going on. How would you act in places where they've taken over? In places where you, um, a lot of people are referring to ungoverned spaces. Someone like me will always tell you there are no ungoverned spaces, but rather on, on alternative, alternative governed spaces. So. How would the state act to make sure that INEC is able to, to um, deliver in those areas? So if you move to places like Northeast, as you're trying to move security around the country to balance um, um, security provisioning, are, are you going to leave spaces for Boko Haram and ISIS swap to think they've left the, their position who can attack? So these things, you have to put all these things in context. You know the number of security you need to deploy at a particular area and at a particular time. Mm -hmm. You see, so that's why I said it's not a standalone. So you need to make sure that you're able to do your mapping very well, your security mapping very well, and able to deploy as, as you need them. And that's why in, in elections like this, it's not only the state security services you need. You equally might need the services of um, other state actors who you know, could assist one way or the other. Hmm. Let's talk about um, rhetorics. We've seen that, um, you know, in, in Nigeria's campaigns, we, we have a lot of jamboree as opposed to, um, you know, strategizing and telling people the how to or, um, you know, how the guides to how they're going to give us what they're promising us. Because like I always say, I have a statement that I say they, they promise that they will turn water into wine just because they want our vote. Uh, but then there's certain rhetorics that we've seen, uh, you know, or heard um, during these campaigns that also somewhat might be adding sorts to the injury that's already been done, knowing that we are a country that's very divided along ethnic and religious lines. And those lines continually are being broadened by these so-called politicians who are trying to ask for our vote. Um, how do we also get in front of these rhetorics and make sure that it doesn't cost more division? Already many have said that this election is more of a regional election because most of these people who are coming out as frontliners seem to be representing different regions of the country. Where do you stand on that? Yeah, so I've seen a lot of them. Some of them are pure hate speech. Some of them are disinformation. Some of them are misinformation. So especially um, through social media, you could see most things you look at, you, you marvel how people are able to sit down, draft, and concrete this kind of rhetorics against people. So it's important that we know that some of those things are either not true, either half truth, or even, or even something that is out of this world. But most importantly, some of the questions I have asked, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of Nigerians are wondering, what is the need of the peace accord that most of these people have signed? So you listen to most of the campaigns, you, 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 some of them are things you will not even want your child to want to see. 
because they are they are they are skippable. You know, situation where people stand on the podium instead of talking about their programs. They are busy busy casting as expression and all forms of you know negative um, ne negative rhetorics on on on, on other you know, other political parties and all that. And incidentally, it cuts across all the, especially the, the, you know, the big political parties. And I think it's not something, something we should continue to condemn. So, um, part of my thinking is that as we, as our, our, our politics and um, democracy evolve, we might start looking at, you know, probably a head speech commission, you know, something close to that. Mm. People who say such things, especially the ones that are identified, um, they should be, you know, they should be brought to law. Something should be done about it. Mm. But, what, know, what, I, I see what, but what's the guarantee I, I that wondering. this would not also be used, uh, you know, as a tool in the hands of whoever the sitting government is to, you know, cast a special on whoever, you know, is the opposition? Because we saw that the... the, the media bill and the hate speech thing that the government of Buhari was trying to push and many Nigerians shut it down and that's because many were afraid that this was going to be a clamp down on those who oppose government so again if we must you know put together something that would criminalize or deal with that um who and who must be on the panel or on the commission or the committee that would draw up that plan so it, it's for me, it's not. It might not even be a commission. It might even be um, for the law enforcement agencies to take, you know, issue of such issues to a level where people start, you know, getting convicted. Convicted. So, if you look at um, most developed countries, you find out that there are things you can post on the social media page, and the, you know, the states, the secret state security services will do their. Would do their job, and if they're if, if that linked to you, you know, you have your day in court. Mm. You know, a Nigerian was jailed for five years in London for what he was, things he said on social media and things he wrote against some ethnic groups in Nigeria, and he got five years. Mm. So nothing stopped a situation where once someone is identified to to spread um, to be spreading head speech that could lead to ethnic rivalry and wars and stuff like that. So why can't the person have a day in court? So that's what I believe. Okay. Finally, I'm going to ask you a two-pronged question because of time. So let's see if you can, um, you know, do justice to that. Now, we know that with the technology that's been introduced into the electoral process, there's going to be, a, uh, you know, a lot of things are going to be cut out. Um, but then it, it, it seems to be heightening money politics now so there's going to be a lot of vote buying um, maybe some at some point even in the open glare of all because that is the only way that politicians might be able to get through to the people they want you know to get votes from and, and how do we deal with this going forward because you see that the, nigerians have devised so many means and there's that saying that Poverty has been weaponized already. I mean, you know what's going on in the country. The economy is bad. People are unable to buy fuel. You can't, you know, light your house. You know, you can't light up your business. I mean, it's a potpourri of issues. But um, again, many have also queried the lack of leadership in the past few years and the president's, you know, local standing in, ta in terms of holding the country together, even as we're getting ready for an election. Many people have even said that there is no government as we speak. What I think is that would there be vote buying? Of course, I I think that would be. Um, to what extent I don't know, but be, look at what I think. If I'm looking through my crystal ball, look at what I think. I think the 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 money, the re, the, the the redesigning of the naira by but CBN will have an effect on how much we were able to do the vote by because the politicians, some of them who have stockpiled all their money waiting for, for this day when they will use it, may not likely have that amount of money to spend. That's one. Two, AKT and the Oshun election showed us one thing, and that is that if we are vigilant about how a lot of things will work out on that day, it's not going to happen the way they want it. I remember what happened in AKT, and when it got to Oshun, Civil society organizations, 
the person who monitor, monitor the, the election, who saw the strategy they, they use in getting people to show who they voted for, mm -hmm. were able to convince INEC on how to put both the golden pulling boot and the pulling boss, thereby stopping them from being able to identify how you voted. Mm -hmm. It made them to lose a lot of steam. That's true. And then three, if not, with the massive if there will be massive turnout of people to vote, it will sort into how much they will be able to spend on vote buying. Mm. Because people to come out, how many 10,000 or 20,000 are you going to give to millions of Nigeria? Mm. So a lot of people might say, I don't need your 10,000 to sell my future for four years. Mm. So if, if a lot of people don't come out, then the money of the, the vote buying will, is going to work or it will have an effect mm. but if a lot of people come out it will it will be kind of um, reduce the effect of vote by on the entire thing mm. and finally just before we go do you see nigeria on autopilot as we speak because again nobody seems to be hearing from mr president as to the plight of the people many have asked you know who's in charge of regulating the fuel price it seems to be uh, you know a free for all um, you know about the oil theft and the fact that, you know, um, a lot of things have gone on, flown under the radar. And don't forget, Mr. President is, of course, the Minister for Petroleum and the Commander-in-Chief. And all of these things are happening directly under his watch. Um, what would um, posterity remember Mr. President for? Well, let me start from the issue of the autopilot. Incidentally, we know that in this country, two years into every administration, especially where um, the government is going to go for a, um, a re-election. The last, the next two years is, is used for election planning and other forms of um, um, activities that will lead to re-election. But I think what we've seen in the last one to 18 months is unprecedented. It hasn't been seen before, you know, and for, from from a, from the point of view of somebody who work in the development space, I think we we've done badly. We've done badly in the sense that even people who should be working in the government have a lot of them have abandoned what they should be doing. Have joined the campaign. For instance, there's no reason why um, Fester Skiemo could could be working for, who will be paying him his salary as a minister, and he's there campaigning for a political party. He don't do that. So it shows that um, the control, the control uh, of this government is, is, is very low. So, well, I believe that probably whatever mistake we've made in this um, government in terms of what didn't work well, whoever wins next election will learn from it and be able to write, um, rewrite most of the history and be able to take Nigeria as where we want to go. I know a lot of Nigerians have, have really not felt very well about how a lot of things have turned out, but the most important thing is that once there is life, there is hope. So hopefully things will start shaping up from uh, May 29 this year. Well, here's hoping upon hope that things would change and would not just be going from bad to worse. And to be seeing what color is the chief executive of next year. And always a pleasure to have you all talk to you on issues such as this. Hoping that you come back and speak with us as we get ready for the elections. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, that's it on the show tonight. Don't forget, go get your PVC. It's been moved from the wards back to the local government areas. Go get your PVC because that is your passport to a new Nigeria. My name is Mary Anakon. Have a good evening. See you tomorrow.